So we have another example of a combined spectroscopy problem. Um, so to identify the structure of an unknown organic compound. So we have a molecular formula, C9H10O2. Okay, so we've got a lot of unsaturation in this molecule. Notice relative to the number of carbons we have, we don't have very many hydrogens. Um, so that would immediately have me thinking of the possibility of an aromatic ring. Um, so let's take a look to the IR and get an idea of some of these functional groups. If I'm thinking aromatic ring, I'm thinking I might see evidence of that ring stretch and also the sp2 carbon hydrogens. So I'm going to look for that sharp ring stretch, and I'm seeing it here at 1616, for a benzene ring. All right, and then I'm going to quickly check the proton and carbon just to make sure that I'm not getting off track. So I'm going to look in the aromatic region of both of those to make sure that I see signals. And I see them here in the proton, and I see some signals in this aromatic region, aromatic, or like alkene, could also show up in that same region of that uh, carbon 13. Okay, so we, we definitely see stuff that's consistent. I think it's worth it to, to, to look for that and then quickly pop out to the proton and carbon because if you had the aromatic ring, you would definitely see the evidence in those spectra as well. Okay, so let's kind of look a little bit more at this IR and see what we have. So 30, 36, um, that's our sp2CH. Okay, so that'd be hydrogens attached to that benzene ring. We've got this 2998 to 2953, and another peak at 2843. All of these are in the range of sp3 carbon hydrogen. And then finally, we've got this really intense peak. 1724, so that's a carbonyl, okay? So when we see a carbonyl, we might wanna to look to the carbon 13 and find that signal, so 167, to get an idea of what type of carbonyl this is. And so this is on the lower end for a carbonyl. So this is where we'd expect to see either an ester or an amide. And we clearly don't have nitrogen in our structure, so it's gotta be an ester. And that fits our O2. So we know that we have a benzene ring and we know that we have an ester. So we actually know quite a bit about this molecule already. So let's go ahead and draw our benzene ring. Okay, and an ester is always going to have this kind of framework. Right, so we really wanna know what's on this side and what's on this side of our ester. So let's, let's move to our proton NMR. And let's go to the aromatic region to get an idea of how this is substituted. So what we see here, it says two times two hydrogen doublet. So that means that each of these signals is a two hydrogen doublet. That's what that's telling us. Okay, so we wanna take a look at the substitution of the benzene ring. So this means overall we have four aromatic hydrogens. So if we do our quick math to see how it's substituted, we know unsubstituted benzene has six hydrogens, and every time you put a substituent on a benzene ring, you remove one hydrogen. So six minus four is two, so we have a di-substituted benzene ring. And then this pattern, this two hydrogen doublet, two hydrogen doublet, very symmetrical pattern, um, that tells us that this is a one, four di-substituted benzene. So let's let's put the substituents on there and let me just draw in some hydrogens to highlight why this pattern tells us that it's 1,4. So that whatever two hydrogens are next to this group are going to be the same as each other. So two hydrogens, so that's where the integration is coming from. And then the other two hydrogens, because we've got that plane of symmetry down the center of the molecule, regardless of what these two groups are. Um, so these are also equivalent. So two hydrogen, two hydrogens. That's why we're seeing two peaks that are both integrating for two. And the doublet, doublet splitting. So this is actually called doublet of doublets. This splitting pattern is very indicative of the fact that they are across from each other, that you have a one, four die substituted. So this one proton, or the, well, they're equivalent. So it's gonna see the one hydrogen next door and one plus one is two, so that's why it's a doublet. And then you can say the same thing for the other one. Okay, so this pattern, this doublet of doublets, very indicative of this one four di substitution. Okay, so let's look at the other two peaks. So we have a three hydrogen singlet. So we have a CH3 that has no neighbors. And it's clearly attached to something. And we've got another CH3, three hydrogen singlet. All 
right? So these are clearly going to be part of the substituents on the ring. We just got to find out what they're attached to. So this first signal, we take a look at the parts per million, the chemical shift. It looks like it's about 3.8 ppm. So that tells me that this one is attached to oxygen. And so that would be the oxygen of the ester. So that's telling us that we've got that piece, right? And then this other three hydrogen singlet, it's about 2.4. So that's going to be allylic to something, to some sort of pi bond. And the only thing we have left is the benzene ring. So that's attached to that, um, we'll just say AR for aromatic ring or aryl group. And so if we take a look at this point, we have all of the pieces of the molecule. because so we only had nine carbons, 10 hydrogens, and two oxygens. So we've got six carbons in the ring. One, two more, so that's eight. And then nine would be the ester. So this C here is gonna be the aromatic ring, okay? So that means we've got the ester on one side and directly opposite on the ring, we have a methyl group, okay? So we've got a proposed structure. And so far this is matching the evidence that we've talked about. I wanna make sure it matches all of the evidence. The first thing I check definitely is I'm gonna go back to that molecular formula and make sure it matches. Cause if it doesn't, it, it's not right. <laughs> so six, seven, eight, nine carbons, okay, check, 10 hydrogens, so three and three is six, and the four aromatics, that's 10, two oxygens, yep, yeah. okay, so it's matching the molecular formula, um, we know it matches the proton, we know it matches the IR, let's go to the carbon 13, um, so we see the ester, we see some aromatic carbons, And then we see these two aliphatic carbons, so at 52 and 22. So 52, that higher chemical shift, that's the one that's attached to oxygen. And at 22, this would be the one that's attached to the aromatic ring. Okay, so that makes sense. So it's consistent with the carbon 13. And then lastly, we should look to the mass spectrum and make sure that we can explain the base peak. So here is our base peak, the one that is at 100% abundance. That's our base peak, okay? And we would expect, I think at this point, that we're gonna cleave off that methoxy group probably. So what that weighs, is a methyl group is 15, oxygen is 16, so 31. And that is actually the difference between this M plus down to where that is. So we're losing 31, so that's the loss of that OCH3. And that is what we'd expect to be the to, to give rise to our base peaks. We're gonna get this resonant stabilized cation. And we've seen this sort of alpha cleavage to a carbonyl quite frequently when we're looking at in the mass spectrum. Um, so now that we've gone through, we've checked all of the evidence, checked the molecular formula, everything is consistent. We can be fairly confident in proposing this structure for our unknown.